All right, so this is just where we left off yesterday with this one page template, which again is not something that necessarily is complicated enough to be a full and complete analysis, but it's great because it highlights the major movements behind a merger analysis. And it can give you, an, in fact, a quick estimation as to what the potential impact would be of a target's financials into an acquirer. So what we had first done, just to recap, is we had laid out the core assumptions, the core considerations. And the acquirer stock price is trading at 100. The target was at 70. The purchase price constraints was the acquirer A, or the acquirer is going to pay by the target at a 25% premium above the current market trading value of 70, so that they're paying $87.5 per share, times 1,500 shares, $131.25 million was the acquisition price. We had given you assumptions of 100 in target fees, 300 in target debt, and so the total 131650 of uses was funded by 50% of equity, 50% of debt. We're going to run sensitivity around this to see what the impact is of each. And then we built out just simple acquire and start target statistics. To estimate the impact of EPS, we only need enough to build to EPS, revenue expenses, EBITDA, DNA, interest taxes, just the simple. And this is what we have, 212, 234, 256. We use the target statistics to make first cut purchase price assumptions, sorry, acquisition multiples, which are different from trading multiples in that acquisition multiples are pay are based on price paid. The implied equity value is the price paid for the stock of the business, which is 131258. The implied enterprise value is the price paid plus the net debt assumed, which is 131550. So we ran some multiples and they're paying about 13.2 times sales. 21.9 times EBITDA, pretty, pretty high. Okay. Now we want to go through the process of merging these businesses using the same ideas that we talked about over the past few days. Remember, in any merger, you are simply adding, right, acquire plus target revenue all the way down to net income, except for items dealing with target equity, because we're buying out the equity, and target debt, assuming that you're paying down the net debt. And in this case, we are paying down the net debt. We're retiring the target debt debt. So, so the first step to a merger is adding together everything about the acquirer and target except for items dealing with target's equity, meaning no target shares, and except for items dealing with target debt, meaning no target interest expense. So let's start there. So literally, literally for revenue, we're taking acquirer revenue and adding it to target revenue. That's what you're doing. You're combining the operations. Copying to the right, right? Same with expenses. We are literally taking the acquire expenses and adding to target expenses. Now, we're being quite broad here. We just lumped all expenses above the EBITDA line together as expenses. In the full-blown model, we'll have several lines for expenses, cost of goods sold, SG&A, you know. And... In addition to what I just mentioned, adding together acquire plus target everything except for items dealing with target debt and target equity, we are making additional transaction adjustments, mainly four. One on synergies, post-merger cost savings. One on the allocation of the purchase price above book value to intangible assets, the amortization on that allocation. One on if we are raising debt to fund the acquisition, and we assume we are here, we will have more interest expense that will impact our analysis. And finally, if we are raising equity to fund the acquisition, we'll have new shares and new dividends to pay. So those are the four issue adjustments. So just as, as, a, as a step back, if anybody asks you, walk me through an accretion dilution analysis, that's it. And together, acquire plus target, revenue all the way down to net income, except for items dealing with target debt and target equity, meaning no target shares, no target interest expense, and then layering in four transaction adjustments, one on synergies, one on the amortization of the, of the per, allocation of purchase price over book value to intangible assets, one on new debt if you're raising debt to fund the acquisition, one on new shares and dividends if you're raising equity to fund the acquisition. That will give you a new EPS that you compare to the old EPS, and that's your accretion. It's that simple. You should be familiar with talking about that at this point. 
let's do it in practice. So the synergies, I gave you an assumption here of 3%, which I will anchor so I can copy that to the right, times the expenses. So we are reducing the expenses by 3%. Oh, made a mistake here. And I'm going to put this as a negative because it will reduce our expenses. Copy to the right. Okay. And the total expenses then are the expenses plus the synergies. We've reduced our synergies, our expenses, by the cost savings. Yeah. So, so sometimes based off of the two assumptions, um, the synergies can be off of purchase price or like 3%? No, they'll never be off of purchase price. Purchase price? Is that what we're doing earlier? Nope. Never. You have to think about intangible assets off of purchase price, I think. Yeah, synergies are off of costs, the cost savings on reducing operations. You can have revenue synergies. Combining two operations, that'll boost your revenue. You can have revenue synergies, but never off of purchase price. Purchase price allocation does not go to synergies. Yeah. Where did you see that? These are the synergies. One percent of EBIT. Uh, Okay, so EBITDA is revenue less expenses, the new expenses. Okay. And so DNA will also add acquire plus target DNA. Simple assumption in the full-blown model, we can get into more detail. We'll add acquire DNA plus target DNA. We will, however, make an additional expense adjustment to the new amortization of our purchase price over book value or whatever portion of that purchase price over book value we will decide to allocate to intangible assets. So there's a table in the book that I found from some accounting firms, I forgot which one it was, Ernst & Young or KPMG, that kind of listed what percentage in historic deals, what percentage of purchase price over book value were actually allocated to intangible assets, which is pretty powerful. But still, it's just such a wide varying percentage. In, as a standard, we use either 20 or 25 percent. And again, as from an analyst perspective, as long as you have these um, these assumptions laid out, you can always easily tweak as the deal comes to the final stages. So this is where we laid it out in the box up here, and in the full blown model, we can get into more detail handling all purchase price allocation. Now we're just going to get to the important one that actually impacts the income statement, which is the allocation of intangible assets. So. We're going to take purchase price, which is the 131250. Remember, it's the equity value of purchase price. So if, if in LBOs, if you have a purchase price that's placed off of enterprise value, you need to remove debt from this to get to the equity value of purchase price because you're comparing it with the book value of equity, not, not book value plus net debt. Compare apples to apples. The price over book, this is not goodwill. Don't get thrown off on the test. This is not goodwill. The first price over book is not goodwill. It is price over book. This gets allocated into several pieces of which the leftover component is goodwill. So we're going to assume that 25% of that will be allocated to intangible assets and amortizable over 15 years. So we're going to take 51, 250 times 25% divided by 15, and there's 854.2 in new amortization as a result of this allocation of purchase price over book value to intangible assets. That's the way to explain it. So the good one would be price over book minus the amortization? Yep. Oh. Everything left over. So, so yeah. Yeah. Not, with, minus, not minus the amortization, minus the allocation to intangible assets. Okay. So... 5150 times 25% is intangible assets. 75% is goodwill, the remainder. 
And I know that that's confusing because the old version of goodwill, goodwill used to be just the purchase price of a book. Now it's been delineated. So some people still call it all goodwill when it's really not. Yes, Brian. So then, uh, uh, you're saying it's only 25% of the money, but then it's 25%. Goodwill. That's goodwill. And that's my point. But that, that goodwill does not impact the income statement. The income statement. It doesn't. It impacts the balance sheet. So we'll see that next week. So that new intent, that new amortization, we can link in and I'll anchor it so I can copy it to the right. We're going to assume that that is constant each year. Well, amortization, you, you generally assume, stays flat each year. Copy to the right. And we will add to get total DNA. Okay. Are you guys okay with that? So we'll get EBIT. EBITDA minus DNA. Everyone getting that? 15475.8. Make sure you are all getting 15475.8. Let me know if you want to look at formulas. Anything like that. What do we do for interest? Just the acquire. Acquire only. Target interest is wiped out. You're adding together everything except for items dealing with target debt, target equity. Target debt's gone. So only acquire interest. Target interest gone. Target debt gone. However, we have an adjustment. We are raising debt to fund the acquisition. We will have new interest on that debt. This is going to be linked in from the debt raised. I'm going to anchor this so I can copy to the right times the interest, which we said was 5% here. I'm going to anchor that so I can copy to the right. That is the new interest on all the new debt raised, giving us a total sum. I'm going to save this. Make sure you have that. Let me know if you have questions. The interest rate was uh, 5%. Five percent. It was yep up in the considerations box. <clears throat> Which one? Yes. The debt raise times the interest rate. And we can now subtract to get EBT. EBIT minus interest is EBT, of course. Okay, and then taxes is that EBT times the tax rate given in the considerations box. With which we can calculate net income like any income statement. 
Seven seven nine zero oh is year three and income. Everyone getting that? Considerations box. What else? Shares outstanding come from where? Acquire only. If those are the two line items you don't add, shares and interest are acquire only. The shares are 3,000. Copy to the right. <clears throat> New shares, we calculate how? The equity raised from E6. Anchor that so we can copy to the right. Divided by the acquirer share price. We're assuming we are the acquirer raising $65.825 million at our share price. Anchor that. Copy to the right. Those are the new shares raised to fund the acquisition, 658.3. What do you think it should be? Because it's identical to what we did on the board. I'm concerned that you're memorizing formulas and not yeah, no, the process. This, this, part, this part I, I got confused on the board. So. Okay. So how would you, if they're raising shares... They're raising 65.825 in equity from the sources, right? Yeah. So we'll start there. And how do we convert that into the number of shares raised? Yep. Yep. C6. You got it. So it's E6 divided by C6. Anchor them both. Giving us total adjusted shares of 3658.3. And then we can calculate the EPS, right? And income divided by shares. So 176, 195, 213. Make sure you get that. 213 in 2018. EPS is 213. Anybody not getting that wants to check some formula somewhere? 2018? Yeah. Let's see. What do you have for EBIT? Good. How about EBT? All right. Net income? Ah, interesting. What are your taxes? Uh, something that you maybe not anchor. Ah, okay. Do not unanchor C44. So only C13 anchor. Just that was just probably a quick. Yeah. Nice. Anybody else? Hmm? Uh, so your share of standing is three, right? 
Newly issued shares? Okay. You are, what is, what is your equity being raised? Sixty-five. Okay, you are. You need to be multiplying fifty percent times the total uses. I think you're multiplying fifty percent by the purchase price only. Make sure your formula is F six times H nine. What is it? Is it F six times H six? Yeah, F six times H nine. And do the same for debt. Make sure debt is F7 times H9. F7 times H9. Okay, good. Anyone else? What is the accretion? The accretion is the difference. Right? C50 minus H29, right? The acquire, right? 14 cents dilution. It is diluted by 14 cents. Ultimately, getting to break even. So you will, that's actually pretty common. It is pretty common for the deal to initially be dilutive, but the important thing is that it'll ultimately become accretive after several years, after synergies are realized and all the kinks are worked out. That's really what you look for. At least break even. You won't always find it an acquisition to be accretive right off the bat. And just because it's dilutive does not mean it's a bad deal. So just notice, note that. Now that's dilution on a, on a, a, a in terms of cents. To look at it in percentage, in percentage, we'll take that difference and divide it by the original EPS. That'll give you the implied percent dilution minus eight percent, all the way to zero percent. E51 divided by J29. So take a couple seconds. Make sure you have that. And now let's talk about. What is driving that dilution? So if I ask you what is driving the dilution? That's part of it. Synergies. Synergies is a, cre a creative. Um, so what are the, what are the drivers, right? So the new equity, yeah. the, the new the new interest on the new debt. What else? Intangible. The intangible asset amortization, just making it dilutive. What else? The new shares issued. New shares issued. Yes. What AJ mentioned. What else? What else is impacting the now dilution and or accretion? What is impacting this? The, the revenue associated with the acquirers. The revenue, every, all the earnings, right? The revenue, the costs. So let's say the EBITDA. Let's say even the EBIT, the target company's EBIT, right? Not the interest because the interest is gone. It's the impact of the target company's EBIT is making this accretive. But then that's being offset. So the accretive elements are what? The EBIT, the target company's EBIT. What are the, what's the other creative element? Repeating what we've said before. The synergies. And then the dilutive elements are the amortization on the intangible assets, the interest expense on the debt raised, and the new shares from the equity. So there's three things that are dilutive that are just. Yep. So you need to think about it that way. Right? So the, the, the first thing you should mention is. The impact is the addition of the target company's EBIT. That's, that's, that's the first impact. It's a positive impact. Right? The other impact is the increase, the additional increase in EBIT because of the synergies. Now the negative impacts are the reduction in EBIT because of the amortization and the reduction in net income because of the new interest and the reduction in the EPS because of the new shares. Those are the other elements weighing down. You need to think about it that way to analyze these things. Yes? So in, in this case, the EBIT was, uh, it drove a higher EPS. If 
if it was the opposite where he did drove a lower EPS, um, that would it would be diluted in that case, right? When you say EBIT, EBIT drove, what do you mean? Drove a lower EPS? Yeah, like earnings per share. So if we drove it, I guess like the current ratio from earnings earnings uh, shares outstanding, right? It was a low a lower EPS than what the acquirer was when that drive it, when that made it diluted. If the new EPS is lower. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but like, I guess, because you were making an argument that e EBIT is, it makes it negative. Is it creative? Always, unless it's negative. Okay. Right? It's always adding to it. Unless the company is losing money. Unless it's a negative EBIT. We'll always add to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there'll be other benefits than operations, the assets, maybe you can <clears throat> squeeze some intangibles, I mean, I don't know, it depends on the situation, you have to figure that out. Below Synergies, maybe. Level, yeah, you think of this putting your cost structure, so they're losing yeah. money, but after a certain mind, I wonder if you can shape. Yeah. Okay, let's analyze the situation a little bit further. So that's the straight impact on accretion and dilution. What about, to, let's test the boundaries of some of these assumptions. But first, let's just look at what the standalone pro forma multiples are, which is often an output for maybe a presentation or something like that. So for example, you know, now that we've analyzed just, and this also highlights the differences between acquire pro forma multiples and the acquisition multiples. Acquisition multiples are the multiples determining what the value is of the company you're, you're acquiring. So these are multiples just based on the target company's underlying data, and it's based on the purchase price. Whereas the pro forma multiples are multiples based on the newly combined entity and its trading value, not purchase value, it's trading value. So for now, we're going to assume that the company trades at the acquirer's stock price when in reality, the acquirer's stock price might decline by like 5 or 10% after such an acquisition. Let's assume that the market value is going to be based on the acquirer's stock price. We'll anchor the value to the acquirer's stock price times the total new adjusted shares. Tosin, you had a question. Yeah, actually, I wanted to just check, because um, I'm giving you a different value of the EPS after showing The cents or the percentage? Right. And so you should get 365825 for market value, and you can copy that to the right. At 14 cents, Tosin. And so to calculate the implied enterprise value, we need a couple other things. We need market value. We need the debt of the acquirer. So we didn't need that before, so just make sure you note that. We need the, the debt of the acquiring entity. We need the entire debt that's left outstanding now. So the target's debt's gone. We've wiped that out. But the acquirer still has debt. So let's say we looked on the balance sheet, and that's what they had, $2.5 million. And then there's new debt that we've raised to fund the acquisition. So the entire debt that's left outstanding on the business is the acquirer's debt plus the new debt raised to fund the business. So I just linked that in from E7, and I anchored that. And so a total debt is the sum of the two. Did you get that figured out? You got the dilution? Yeah, I did. 
C6 times C49. And so enterprise value is, of course, that market value plus the total debt that we've just calculated, which is the acquire outstanding debt plus the new debt. And then we'll use the new combined statistics that we've analyzed in the merger model to create market value and enterprise values respectively. So the enterprise value to sales is the enterprise value we just calculated divided by the revenue, of course. You can copy that to the right. Enterprise value to EBITDA, of course. Enterprise value divided by EBITDA. Copy to the right. Enterprise value to EBIT, enterprise value divided by EBIT. Yeah? Okay. You guys got this. Market value to net income is the market value divided by net income, of course. And price to EPS is the price of the acquirer, the price that the entity is trading at, which we assumed is the price of the acquirer, Anchor that divided by the earnings per share, which is the same number as the market value per net income. Those are the multiples. So take an additional few seconds to get that. And those are just outputs. It's not I'm not focusing more on I'm not focusing so much on the multiple calculations. You've done comps before, but just the perspective of it in this case. Oh, how did you get market value? You mean thirty two? Thirty five all the way in the top? Three six five. Thank you. Stock price. Stock price times the shares. You said those two market value over net income. Yeah. That's right. One is on a per share basis, one is on a grossed up basis. And the reason you're, you can compare mark, uh, net income to market value is because it's post uh, taxes and interest and all that stuff. Yeah, you were exactly. To keep it up or, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Good. Are we using the, the price to come from 86? Sorry, 87? 87? 100. Oh, 100. Acquire. We're analyzing the newly traded entity. Okay. I want to look at analyzing this example, um, adjusting variables. So I'm sure you've done a two-variable data table before, but let's just kind of go through it. And the way to do it is, so the, the benefit of a two-variable data table is to allow us to make quick adjustments to variables that impact the model and analyze all those adjustments at one glance, right? So, so in other words, Right now, I'm going to assume that the two variables we want to adjust, which are the, the most major variables in the situation, is varying the equity debt um, uh, sources and the premium. So right now, we are running a case where there's 50% equity and 25% premium. And that case is resulting in a 0% 2018 EPS. So the way to read this table is at 50% equity, so the, the variables across the table, I want to represent percentage of equity and 25% premium, the EPS is 0%. Right? If we were to run a case that said, let's say, for example, 25% uh, equity, so we're going to hard code in 25% in F6 and 15% premium, okay, so more debt. 
right? If we were to vary those, adjust those variables, what would the output be? The output would be 1%. So, oh, I don't have a 25% premium case. So let's say, let's say 0% uh, uh, equity. I don't have a 25% equity case. If we do 0% equity or 100% debt and 15% purchase premium, what's the result? The result is negative 4%. So in the 0% equity case, which is this column, and in the 15% case, we'll have negative 4% EPS, right? So you can fill out this table manually, or you can use a two-variable data table to automatically populate this table, and that would be beneficial because that way, if you ever tweak the model here or the structure of the model, it would automatically update the table. And the way to do that is, number one, in the upper left corner of the table, you need a link in from the model that represents what you want the table to be populated with. We want the table to be populated with 2018 EPS accretion dilution. So cell G44 is going to equal E52 because we want the, the table to be populated with 2018 EPS. Then to the right of that link, we need one series of variables, and your model must be dependent on those variables, of course. Underneath that, you need a second series of variables that your model needs to be dependent on. So to the right, we have 0, 50, 100%. We assume we want that to represent percent equity. Underneath, we have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. We want that to represent percent premium. So we highlight the whole table, including the percentages. Don't worry about what's in the middle. It'll be overwritten. And we can run our data table by doing Alt-DT, Alt-DT, data table, or we can go to data. What if analysis, depending on your variation of Excel, Excel, data table, and it'll ask you for two input values, row input cell and column input cell. And the row input cell says, of the variables along the row, 0, 50, 10%, it only sees these as hard codes. Where does it have to go in the model to update, change these variables to vary the output? Where does it go? Uh, percent equity. So the row input cell is our percent equity F6. The column input cell asks of the variables up and down the column, it only sees it as a hard code right now, where does it go in the model to make these adjustments to vary the output? Percent premium. So column input cell? C8. Good. C8. Hit OK. And this is what you should get. If you have, if you, if your numbers are different, your model is wrong. Okay, your model is not linking properly. So we can look at that. However, well, I still have like zero percent, maybe twelve percent. Uh, okay, well, that's because you're running a different case then. You're running the 50% equity and 15% premium. That's fine. That, 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 that could change depending on, but as long as these are right. Okay, very important. What is this saying? We can look at this at a glance. What, does this make sense? What is this telling us? As we talk, let's go up and down the, the column. As the premium increases, what happens to, to the dilution? It's getting more dilutive. Does that make sense? Why? You're paying more. You're paying more, more costs on the impact. The, the benefit of the tire company's EPS isn't changing, but you're raising more equity, you're raising more debt. The more equity that you're raising, the more shares you're issuing. The more debt that you're raising, the more interest. You're paying more. More dilutive. What happens if you go from 0% equity to 100% equity? Assuming that the cost of equity should be, would be more than the cost of debt cash. Should be, but it's accretive. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Well, I guess if it's an all stock deal, what John talked about earlier, why PE is less than, or the target's PE is less than the acquirer's PE. Then it would be a 
Other way around. So this probably has to do with the stock price and might be able to cut this year. It will raise more money and mm -hmm. issue less share. Yes. So does explain also, that. Does it also have to do with the fact that the interest rate on the debt ties to the it, it could. So let's let's step back. So 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 are you okay with the idea that that the raising more equity is making this deal creative? Does that make sense? From a standard perspective, what do you think? Silence. Why not? Because you're you're diluting your your shares by adding new shares by issuing fifty percent. I mean, should raising equity be more or less dilutive than raising debt? Why? Because equity is more expensive. Because equity is more expensive. Equity, why is equity more expensive? It's more risky. Raising equity should be more dilutive. In a standard scenario, raising equity should be more dilutive than raising debt. In this case, raising equity is less dilutive. Why? Why is raising equity less dilutive? It could deal with the stock price. What is the what is the variable? What is the impact when raising equity versus raising debt? What's the variable that we look at? When we're raising equity, it's the stock price. When we're raising debt, it's the interest. When we're raising debt is the interest. The interest the interest rate creates interest expense, which reduces our net income, reduces our EPS. In in the stock case, in the hundred percent stock case, it's the number of shares issued that reduce that that causes our dilution driven by the stock price. So what is it about this scenario that's causing our standard model that we usually know about where raising equity should be more than raising debt invert? Either the interest rate that we're raising is so high that raising debt is now more dilutive than raising equity or something else is happening, right? The other variable with raising equity is the stock price. Something must be different about the stock price that is causing our standard that we would know as a rational investor where raising equity should be more dilutive than raising debt no longer consistent. What is that based on? PE. I mean, John, you said it. What's PE? Why? What about the PE? It's overvalued. Again, going back yeah. to what you said, overvalued. And I'm just explaining it. You are right. I'm just explaining it. Yeah. If the PE is overvalued, if the PE is valued so high, then what's happening? You're paying for a premium on the earnings. Yeah, and what else is happening? It's becoming more expensive. Uh, it's cheaper to raise more capital. It's, cheap, it's cheaper to raise capital. If your PE is so high, which means the stock is so high, you can meet your funding needs by raising very few shares, right? So in the example, and, I, and you don't have to do this here, but in the example where it was 50% equity, 50% debt, they had to raise 605 shares to meet their funding needs. In the 100% equity case, they had to raise 1,000 shares to meet their funding needs. This was an accretive deal. Maybe if, they're mo if, the, if the acquirer, sorry, if the, if the company was more accurately priced, they might have to raise 10,000 shares, a lot more shares to meet their funding needs. If the company is overvalued, then they are able to raise um, their funding, meet their funding needs by raising few shares. What implication does that cause? That causes deals like this to potentially be accretive. Why is this happening? Why are the markets allowing this? Why are the markets allowing? Why are you as an investor <laughs> buying this knowing that you are basically taking all the risk right you understand that because it's it's more beneficial to be doing debt in this case right 
Maybe you are you are pricing in expected growth, right? Maybe. Why else? Nobody really knows. It's a debate. This is what came on. So this is an exemplary of what of what happened. It's kind of happening now in some IPOs. But what's happened a lot in 2000, 2001? Companies, big big co tech companies, were buying. Companies with storied assets, AOL Time Warner is a great example, right? AOL Time Warner is a, company, a tech company, internet company, internet company, dot com, they called it back then. And they were able to raise a lot of money cheaply to acquire a company, Time Warner, that had a lot of fixed storied assets. And they did it by raising all stock. It was a stock swap. And back then they did it and the deal was a creative. And a lot of articles came out saying, oh, you know, CAPM is wrong. This is a new paradigm. CAPM doesn't exist anymore, right? So why did they say that? Because they were able to make an accretive deal when in reality CAPM says, well, if you were to raise equity, it should be dilutive. Well, what's faltering? What is the, where is, where is that disconnect? And that disconnect is be yeah, it's because CAPM works if the market is efficient, depending on if the investor is rational. So the debate against that CAPM doesn't work anymore is, no, CAPM does work. Maybe the investor is rational. Why are the investors all of a sudden paying all this money for a company AOL? You could speculate. I mean, this is a time when E-Trade was just popping up and Ameritrade, and there's a lot of movements happening, and you're able to just put your credit card on the Internet if you trusted it and start trading without having to open up a Charles Schwab account and going through a broker, which allowed a lot more people putting money in there, perpetuating hype. And I believe that's what was happening. Um, and so I, I believe that CAPM could work, but there are a lot of irrational investors out there, right? So the whole model of, of course, equity being more dilutive than debt is based on the fact that an investor would see a model like this and understand raising equity is too costly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay an enormous amount of money for AOL. And then what happened? People saw that a little bit later after the fact. Markets corrected. AOL had to devalue a lot of assets. They split up. It was market destruction, right? And, and that, that's, that's the lesson there. But the, this model should still work had the acquirer been priced and valued appropriately. So it does depend on the PEs in some sense. So let me explain that. So, oh, it's 11 o'clock. Let's go real quick. So the acquirer's stock price is 100. The acquirer's EPS is 2. So the acquirer's PE is about 50, overvalued, right? Traditional PEs, S&P 500 is 15, 16 times. The acquirer is overvalued, case in point. If the acquirer was appropriately valued at like 15 times PE, we should see a standard trend. How do we force the acquirer's PE? Let's lower the acquirer's stock price. If the acquirer's stock price is relatively valued, 15 times PE means trading at about $30. If it's trading about $30 per share at $2 EPS, that PE would have been about 15 times. Then you should see a more standard trend, right, where the 100% equity case is more dilutive than debt. So this model proves that raising equity should be more dilutive if your company is priced fairly. So think about that. That is the biggest takeaway you can you can see from a subjective side of, of an accretion dilution analysis. And we will end there. Yeah. So think about that. We could talk more about that. But remember, there's the exam Monday on valuation. And next week, I want to get into honing in on what the difference is between this and a full scale merger model. And we'll talk about the merger of Office Depot, Office Max next week. Cool. Thank you.